Porphyria's Lover is a poem that tells the story of a man, in this case the speaker, who is having an illicit affair with a woman who is of a higher social class than he is. The poem is set one evening when the woman comes to visit him and during the course of the evening he decides, for reasons that we're going to go into in the in the analysis, to kill her and he kills her by wrapping her hair around her, her throat and strangling her. It's a dark psychological poem that takes the form of a dramatic monologue and it has a very very tight strict rhyme scheme that we're going to also go into in this analysis i'm going to talk you through the themes the language features the structure and generally just talk you through the poem make sense of every line so that you fully understand it because it is quite a a tough poem um grab a pen and paper grab a copy of the poem and annotate it as we go through and let's get on with it The poem opens. The rain set early in tonight, the sullen wind was soon awake. It tore the elm tops down for spite and did its worst to vex the lake. It almost opens like a story. The speaker sets the scene before the poem actually starts. So we learn that um, the speaker. Uh, the poem is happening during a sort of storm. The events of the poem happen during a storm. There's a technique in literature which you've probably you've probably heard of by now if you're doing GCSE called the pathetic fallacy. I think the pathetic fallacy is is definitely is definitely at play in these opening lines. We've got the rain, we've got the wind, we've got the wind being personified described as sullen so browning gives the wind an emotion and the lake's given an emotion as well the lake is vexed um, if you imagine the speaker looking at the lake and seeing the wind hitting the lake and making the lake choppy he's almost thinking of the lake as being agitated which perhaps reflects his own emotions that he's agitated as well so the lake and the wind are personified. We've got the verb tore. The wind tore the tops off the trees. Quite a violent verb, which perhaps foreshadows some of the um, events in the poem because we know that if you've read this poem, which I hope you have by now, you know that it's a, it's a poem about murder. And the wind is also given another emotion in that it's tearing the tops of the elms down for spite spite is when you're kind of nasty or you know yeah just nasty and vicious towards somebody hateful towards somebody so we've got the personification of the wind the personification of the lake the fairly violent verb to tear and the pathetic fallacy just generally setting a scene that is kind of it tells you perhaps that the poem is going to be um just a fairly dark poem you know the pathetic fallacy in this poem creates that that idea of something dark happening and you know it's not going to be a pleasant poem in the fourth line the narrator tells us that he listens with heart fit to break so he's listening to the storm and his heart's breaking so we know that he's upset about something we don't know what he's upset about yet but we're going to come back to that line because i think it's i think it's kind of quite important the fifth line in the poem introduces porphyria and just the way that she comes into the poem she is quite telling she glides in when glided in porphyria you know the verb to glide perhaps suggests effortless effortlessness you know this idea that she doesn't walk in she glides in she's effortless she's 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 immediately kind of presented to us as somebody quite powerful perhaps somebody quite majestic um and what's interesting to note is that she doesn't she doesn't knock either she just enters you know she doesn't have to knock she just enters the scene um and this is going to bring me to to sort of one of the themes in the poem in a minute but i'm going to i'm going to just talk you through a couple of lines first when she comes into the poem she immediately has a really big effect 
are not only the poem itself and the and the the sort of atmosphere in the poem but also on the speaker's world the speaker is there sitting in his cottage he lives in a cottage as we learn and he's sitting there listening to the storm and browning's kind of worked quite hard to build up the intensity of the storm in the first four or five lines of the poem and then look what happens to to the storm when poor fire comes in she shuts the cold out and the storm almost like she has control straight away of the weather Porphyria is a woman who is in control in this poem. She she it, she instantly has an impact on the speaker's world, on the cottage, on the atmosphere of the poem. So Porphyria is a powerful woman. And what's interesting is that it doesn't say in this line here, it doesn't say she shut the door. It says she shut the cold out and the storm. So she's able to just instantly change everything. What she then does is she kneels down and she makes the cheerless grate. The grate is just what you light a fire in. It's like a kind of, I guess, metal or iron basket that you would light a fire in. And Porphyria builds the fire up in the grate. You know, think about the fire for a second. The fire is kind of a man's job, isn't it? Lighting the fire, it's kind of a man's job, an alpha male sort of job. It's a man's domain. And Porphyria lights the fire. She comes in, she shuts the cold out, she lights the fire, she brings warmth to the cottage. But what, what I think is significant about this is that Porphyria has the upper hand in this relationship. Um, notice the way that Browning personifies the great as well the great is cheerless until Porphyria comes in and at that point it blazes up and suddenly all the cottage is warm so within what six seven eight lines however many lines we've had a big change in the poem we've had this this kind of storm created and then instantly Porphyria comes into the poem she enters the scene and everything begins to change now I'm going to take you down here because if you've got a spare piece of paper in front of you, which I think you should have, it will, it will be useful to you. I'd like you to make a table like this and in one column I'd like you to put Porphyria and in the other column I'd like you to put Speaker. And this is something that I think is going to help you understand this poem, understand the structure of the poem, but also one of the key themes in the poem. And one of the key themes in this poem is power and control. And Porphyria, at the beginning of the poem, is very much in control now we know that that changes in the poem that does that does definitely change in the poem pivots but to begin with we're going to think about how Porphyria is in control the first way that Porphyria is in control is with I'll just take that line off with the title of the poem Porphyria's Lover if we scroll up the actual title Porphyria's Lover suggests that Porphyria owns the speaker, the speaker is the lover, and in this title, Porphyria has ownership of the speaker, as denoted by the possessive apostrophe. So in this in this um in this in this poem, from the very moment that we begin reading the poem, Porphyria has control. And the first way that she has control is in the title. Now I want you to remember that it, this is a poem that's written in the Victorian era, when women generally didn't have control of men women were subservient to men uh, which means that if a man was was in a relationship with a woman then you know uh, the man would have the upper hand certainly if the woman was his wife but Porphyria is not the speaker's wife Porphyria is his lover and they're having an illicit affair they're having something that's behind closed doors and he's kept quiet and part of the reason that they're not together is because they're of a, they're of a different social status and in the poem Porphyria, and I'll come to this in a bit, is of a higher social, whoop, or osial, however you want to spell it, social status. Porphyria has a higher social status in the poem than the speaker, i.e. She's, she's richer than him, she's of, a, she's of a higher class than him, okay? We know the speaker doesn't have much money because he describes himself as living in a cottage, and at the time, a cottage was somewhere where poorer people who probably worked the land you know farmers or farmers laborers would have lived so the speaker is not is not somebody who has a lot of money porphyria does though porphyria has a higher social status porphyria change oh god almighty changes the atmosphere um she's able to come into the poem and she's able to change the atmosphere in the poem porphyria makes the fire up and porphyria 
lets herself in and I'm going to put that verb glided in brackets just to remind ourselves of how she moves so if you're if you're making this table there's already a lot of evidence to show you that Porphyria is the one that is in control in the poem okay so to go back to the poem um, we have this this situation where Porphyria comes in she shuts the card up she makes the grate up she, the fire blazes up the cottage is suddenly warm and when she's done all of that she rises and what she does is she withdraws her cloak she takes her cloak off she takes her shawl off she lays her gloves down she unties her hat and she lets her damp hair fall and i want you to bear in mind porphyra has just come through what is a raging storm so she's soaking wet you know she's um she's windswept she's soaking wet and the first thing she does after she's started she's she's made the fire up and, and warmed the place up and shut the door the first thing she does is she she kind of takes all her, her wet clothes off what's interesting is that whilst this is all happening the narrator the speaker is watching her the speaker is not saying a lot at this point in the poem in fact the speaker i would say at this stage in the poem almost becomes invisible and the focus is entirely on porphyria and we have a lot of imagery imagery of what she's doing i think this part of the poem is fairly sinister because we later on obviously find out that the speaker has decided to kill her and it does it does beg the question when he's watching her do this stuff what's going through his mind is he beginning to sort of already think about killing her? We don't we don't know. We don't know how premeditated this murder is. We know it's premeditated, and I'll explain why later. But we don't know how premeditated is the murder is. But at this point, he's watching her, and I think on a second reading of the poem, you could suggest that that's quite sinister. If you look at this line, I listen with heart fit to break, you know, a bit earlier in the poem, you could read that as the narrator kind of um, being a bit upset that Porphyria is not his and will never be with him however you could read it as his heart's breaking because he's already begun to think that maybe he'll kill her so there's a bit of a kind of it's a bit ambiguous as to how premeditated the murder is but i would suggest that these these sort of four or five lines when he watches her are quite are quite sinister there's also a lot of focus on her hair she let her damp hair fall browning draws our attention to her hair with that imagery and that's significant because he kills her with her hair so perhaps you could suggest that this is a sense of foreshadowing that's going on in the poem after she's done all of that she sits down by his side and last she sat down by my side and i think that verb that is not a verb that word last um is significant it almost suggests that perhaps the speaker feels that porphyria should have paid him more attention initially when she entered rather than doing everything else first and then going to him and then sitting down by his side and she called me and i want to look at the verb called you know again that sense that porphyria is the one in control she calls him almost like he belongs to her um so i want us to add to our table the fact that she calls him almost as if you know she owns him the speaker in the poem has what we would call an inferiority complex which is when you believe that somebody thinks that they're better than you and you don't like it and i would suggest that the speaker doesn't like the fact that porphyria has kind of done all this stuff before she's given him the attention and that word last sort of suggests that to me and his response to this is to ignore her when no voice replied so he ignores her almost like he's kind of in a bit of a mood with her and he's going to kind of you know he's going to let her know through his body language and his actions that he's not very happy with her but when he ignores her she puts his arm about her waist so she physically takes his arm at that point almost like he's a puppet and she puts his arm around her and then when she's done that she made her smooth white shoulder bare <coughs> um to me this is quite sensual imagery there's a there's a real kind of sexual overtone to this imagery she's showing him a bit of naked flesh okay which you know bear in mind this is victorian poetry you know it's not it's not by today's standards this is this is obviously nothing but back back in the day you know the victorian times you know 
things are a little bit different. This is quite sensual imagery. It's quite overtly sexual, the way that she's behaving towards him. So first of all, she takes control of his body and almost treats him like a puppet by moving his arm. And then she kind of displays quite overt sexual overtones by this image where she shows him her shoulder. She shows him a bit of flesh. So to add to our table, um, and if you're not doing this table, you're going to find this annoying that I keep coming backwards and forwards. But if you are doing the table, and you've got your paper in front of you, this is going to be quite useful. Um, Porphyria, um, I want to put manipulates his body um, by moving his arm. And then um, Porphyria, um, how, how would I word this? Um, Porphyria displays flesh so she makes the first move if you like you know she takes she takes control in terms of you know the the flirting or whatever so again you know that 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 link with the idea of control and power and who has the power and who has the control and also you know to think back to the beginning the poet the poet is in the speaker sorry is in the house waiting for her so in that sense she also has the power um after she's made her, sh her, sh her white shoulder bare, he notices that her yellow hair is displaced. Oopsie daisy, I don't know what happened there. He notices that her yellow hair is displaced. And um, we have this focus once again for the second time on her hair. Again, perhaps uh, browning, foreshadowing uh, Porphyro's eventual murder because we know that she is murdered with her hair. Um, and then we've got this line, and I think this is a really key line in the poem. And stooping, she made my cheek lie there. So think about the image of Porphyria standing above the, the speaker, showing him her shoulder, pulling her top down, and showing him a bit of flesh, and then stooping down to him to be on his level. That verb stooping takes on quite a symbolic meaning. Porphyria is literally stooping to, to kind of reach the narrator or the speaker. But also, she's stooping to be there in the first place because Porphyria is of a higher class than he is. She is of a higher social class than the speaker. So just to be with him, to be with somebody who is, who is below you in societal terms, certainly in this time, in the Victorian times, would have been seen as stooping. So Porphyria stoops. So that verb, to stoop, in that line has a symbolic meaning and it also has a literal meaning okay so I think that's worth being aware of in the next line we've got another mention of her hair so for the third time in like however many lines the poet or the speaker mentions her hair the poet chooses to draw our attention to her hair which again perhaps foreshadows what's going to happen and then she murmurs how she loved me so the, the 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 speaker says that at that point she murmured how she loved him now i'm going to i'm i'm going to i'm going to say something now that this is this is kind of inference but this is what i consider to be a psychological poem the reason it's it's laid out as a dramatic monologue is because dramatic monologues are really good ways to give the give the audience or the reader in this case an insight into the mind of the person who's speaking and i think we get a real insight into the mind of the speaker in this poem and i don't think he always intends us to see the things that we see but we do see them so if we're to take the idea that he is he has an inferiority complex um, and he you know he's, he's a bit annoyed because Porphyria kind of doesn't really doesn't will never really be with him because she thinks she's a bit better than him then I think that verb murmuring could suggest perhaps to the speaker that she doesn't really mean it like she says it kind of half-hearted oh, I love you like she doesn't you know what I mean she doesn't really mean it so I think that that verb's worth being aware of as well and then we've got these kind of five or six lines that are quite confusing. I'm going to walk you through them and just tell you what they mean, basically. Porphyria then says um, that uh, she would like to be with him. She would like to set herself free from her other life, her life where she may have another fella. She may be married. We don't really know. But certainly, you know, she's, she's, she's mixing in higher circles. And she'd like to, to set herself free from that. But she feels that she can't. Um, she can't set herself free from it and she can never really be with the speaker because of her pride. She feels that it would be it would be too 
too much for her to stoop that low and to be with somebody of a lower class so this idea of her being being proud she can't sever those ties um and she's not prepared to give herself to him and to be with him um however she then says despite this feeling and despite all of this being the case that sometimes passion would overcome her and she'd be thinking about him and she'd think you know what i've just got to see him i love him i don't care i love him and sometimes passion gets the better of her and tonight she's been at a feast and this word feast i think is quite important because it tells us that um again she's rich because rich people have feasts normal people don't have feasts they have dinner do you know what I mean? They have a meal. A feast is like a banquet. So the fact that she's been at a feast suggests that she's she's from a high a high social class. And tonight she's been at a feast and she's thought about the narrator. She's had a sudden thought of one so pale. She's thought about the speaker. And, um, you know, she's thought, you know what, I need to be with him. Even though, you know, I know this will never work. Even though I know we can never be together, I love him. And I just want to be with him. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just forget all of the 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 feast forget the, the fact that i'm of a higher social class than he is i'm just going to go and i'm going to spend the night with him because i love him and so she's pulled herself away and she's come through wind and rain to see the narrator or the speaker at this point the poem begins to pivot because i think at this point the speaker begins to realize how much of a compliment it is that she's 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 done this he begins to realize that even though she's 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 richer than me she's better than me she's of a higher status than me the fact that she's dragged herself through the storm to be with me tonight and risked our affair getting out and risked all of this and come through wind and rain you know what she must love me she must and so the poem begins to pivot and actually the speaker becomes quite happy and it says here that he looks up into her eyes and he feels happy and proud and at last he knew he knows that porphyria worships him this is an interesting an interesting verb worshipped because actually what we'd expect him to say there is at last i knew that porphyria loved me but he doesn't say loved he says worships almost as if he wants more than love from her he want he wants he wants something he wants almost for her to be below him that's that inferiority complex that I'm talking about. He wants for her to be below him. And in fact, it is the other way around. So to go back to our table, I believe at this point that the power in the play begins to... Sorry, in the play, in the, in the poem, the power and the control begins to tip and it begins to move more in favour of the speaker. And so in your second column at the bottom of your table... I want you to write, and this is the reason I'm doing this is because it's it's nice and easy. Then it's laid out for you, and you can really see it. Speaker in control, and that begins that pivotal moment in the in the poem begins when the speaker begins to believe that Porphyria worships him. So speaker believes that Porphyria worships him. Because at that point, he doesn't just believe that Porphyria loves him. He believes she worships him, like he's some sort of god, and she's a lesser being, she's a mere mortal. So he then believes that, you know, he has the upper hand. And this is why he he decides to kill her. Because he knows that if, if he doesn't kill her now, tomorrow she's going to wake up, uh, she's going to say, that was nice, you know, that was, that was really nice, thanks for that. I'm off back to my, my other life back to my husband if she has one we don't know but back to my friends back to whoever but she's going to leave him she's going to leave him there in his little cottage and he's going to be back at square one so he gets to this moment in the poem where he he realizes that for that split second she she loves him she's prepared to give herself to him she worships him and he thinks you know what i could kill her now i could stop time i could have her in this moment and she would stay there forever. And the fact that he kills her and he decides to do that again is him exercising power and control over her. He pacifies her in the ultimate way. And surprise makes his heart swell and it grows. 
and then we've got this line while I debated what to do so at this point we know that he's beginning to think about killing her so this is a premeditated murder this is not a murder that happens in a moment of passion where he gets angry and just kills her this is premeditated it's thought through whether it's thought through when he says his heart's breaking at the beginning of the poem is fairly ambiguous it's not entirely clear but definitely at the, by this line he's thinking about it and he's thinking shall i do it shall i not and then he says at that moment she was mine mine fair perfectly pure and good so he then believes her to be his now i want to go back to the title the title porphyria's lover in the in this title at the beginning of the poem porphyria owns the speaker by now the speaker owns porphyria so there's been a full turn you know the whole the whole table and the balance of the table has tipped completely in favor of the speaker who now believes that he has complete control of her whereas at the beginning she had complete control of him that repetition of mine emphasizes the fact that he believes he owns her and then he begins to objectify her as perfectly pure and good almost exactly what he wants from a woman finally finally she's the woman that i want so i'm going to add to our table um be believes her to be his begins to objectify her so you can see from this table that we're beginning to get an idea of the structure of the poem just just make it a bit smaller for you we're beginning to get an idea and a picture of the structure of the poem and also of the of the um the theme of power and control in the poem the power and control is a is a key theme in the poem so by by doing this like this you've got almost a little revision note for yourself do you know what i mean when you come back to this you can look at it you can say okay yeah 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 i remember that let's let's go back and you could even if you wanted back these up with quotes pick some quotes out and, and bang the quotes underneath the underneath the line so you've got for every point you've got a quote and i think that will really help you not only write about the poem but just understand the poem if you're struggling with it if you're not and you get it then like fair play you haven't you haven't got to worry about it um but if if you don't then i think this is quite useful um so he begins to objectify her and then he and then he decides i'm going to kill her and he's by this point he's decided i found a thing to do and all her hair in one long yellow string i wound three times her little throat around and strangled her and we've got this full stop after strangled her um and i think that kind of almost when you read the poem for the first time you stop dead at that line partly because of the fact that it just appears to come out of nowhere but also because the full stop makes you stop dead it's almost like her last breath and then there's that moment of silence as, a, as the life just goes from out of her. So I think that full stop is there for kind of dramatic purposes. And it's quite a violent image when you think about it. You know, think about that image of somebody wrapping, somebody's got long hair and somebody comes up behind them, wraps that hair three times around their throat and then throttles them to death. Very violent, very violent image. And um and then what what kind of it makes me laugh? I think there's kind of a little bit of humour going on here. He then immediately backs that up by saying, "Oh, she didn't feel any pain." Yeah, I mean we've just had this image of him strangling her with her hair. Think about that for a minute. He wouldn't have done this. It wouldn't have been a spur of the moment thing. This we know it's premeditated. But even when he started to kill her, she'd have kicked up a fuss. She'd have struggled. She'd have fought. This wouldn't have been quick. It's not like he pulled out a gun and went bang and she was dead. You know, he throttled her, he garroted her to death with her own hair. She would have fought, she would have kicked out. He continued to kill her and he saw it through. So this is a deeply disturbed person that is that is narrating this poem. You know, this is a deeply disturbed person. And I come back to the dramatic monologue. The form of the dramatic monologue allows us to, to really see his his psyche you know it allows us to see the psychology and what's going on in his mind it's worth looking at the rhyme scheme at this point as well you know found hair wound around um she pain be again stain duh 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 very controlled rhyme scheme very intense rhyme scheme you know doesn't break much it, it, it's very it's very predictable 
and it's controlled and control is a very very big theme in this poem so I think the rhyme scheme keys into that theme of control so he says that she felt no pain and we know that that can't be the case and we know he, do, he can't believe it and we now have to begin to question how reliable he is as a speaker really and then he, he backs it up by saying it again I'm quite sure she felt no pain almost as if he's trying to convince himself but this time he kind of modifies that sentence with quite sure he's not 100% if you're quite sure it's not like oh what, what you know what time did you, does your train come 3 o'clock you sure I'm quite sure so you're not 100% definite so it's that idea that he's kind of trying to convince himself at this point that he, she didn't feel any pain maybe he's trying to think through the events and then what he does is he opens her eyes he, he actually there's a simile here as a shut bud that holds a bee I warily opened her lids he opens her eyes and he looks into her eyes and those of you that are that are very astute will have already noticed that there's been a full turn of events here because in the first part of the poem Porphyria manipulates the, the speaker's body in the second part of the poem the speaker manipulates Porphyria's body. So there's been a full 360 degree turn here and the speaker is now fully in control. And of course Porphyria is dead. The ultimate way to pacify somebody and to take control of them is to kill them. It's a dark poem. You know, it's a very dark poem. There's no getting away from it. And he says, oh, the, the, the blue eyes laughed without a stain, almost as if to say there was no sign in her eyes that there was any, any fear or terror, which we've got to find very hard to believe, considering that he's just throttled her to death with her own hair. You know, she wouldn't have just been like, oh, yeah, I'll let him do it, I don't care. Do you know what I mean? There would have been a struggle. He would have, it would have been a very violent death. So that line, laughed the blue eyes without a stain, I would not, I would not trust that line. I think at the moment we're getting an insight into the, the, the speaker's mind that tells us that the speaker is, is, is just really delusional. So delusional is the word. And then he untightens the tresses, he unwinds the hair about her neck, almost as if he's trying to rewind time because what he has now is a woman who is placid passive his belongs to him will not argue back will not speak out of turn to him will not leave him in the morning does not believe she's better than he is he's got he's got the woman he wants this is a poem about a man exercising control over a woman in an era where men typically had the upper hand okay um, he unwinds the tress about her neck um, and he kisses her cheek bit of alliteration there her cheek once more blushed bright beneath my burning kiss the alliteration maybe gives it a sense of passion perhaps um, you know I don't know just be aware of it it's worth being aware of and then he props her head up as before only this time my shoulder bore her head which droops upon it still. So again, he manipulates her body. He holds her up. She, she, she is falling on him as opposed to him resting on her, like in the beginning of the poem. Full, a hundred percent turn and change in the poem. Um, and this line, her head which droops upon it still, brings us into the present. So we learn at this point that what has happened up until now has happened very, very recently, and that the speaker is still sitting there in the room with the dead body of Porphyria doing all this weird stuff to her. It's not happened three or four years ago. It's happened just now. And perhaps that's why he's replaying it in his head to try and make sense of it. You know, he's just killed somebody. You know, it's not something you do every day. So he's trying to sort of sit there and he's trying to replay it in his head and kind of make sense of it. And then we're back in, we're in the present at this point. The smiling, rosy little head, so glad it has its utmost will. And he begins to believe that Porphyria wanted this. Porphyria, all Porphyria wanted was him. And she couldn't have him. But now he's made it possible for her to have him by taking all her problems away. All those problems of her being rich and from a better, better family than he is and from a higher class than he is. All the barriers that stood in front of them and stopped her from having him, they're all gone now. He's done her a favour. He's taken all those barriers away. So now she can have him. He, he is hers and she is his. And he says, you know, um, all that scorned at once is fled and I its love am gained instead. 
Porphyria's love, she guessed not how her darling one wish would be heard. The speaker by now is completely delusional. He fully believes that Porphyria wanted this to happen and that he's done it. He's done her a favour and now she can have him. And thus we sit together now and all night long we have not stirred and yet God has not said a word. And at that point, um, he believes that um, God has not moved to, to punish him the house or the cottage hasn't been struck by a bolt of lightning and so he's probably got away with it but of course you know we know and like i said before it's a psychological poem so we know his state of mind from looking at the poem and things that we can infer from the poem we know his mind is is not sound so uh, we can we can really start to question you know his his judgment at this point one last word before before i leave you to it porphyria um was some sort of a disease that led eventually to madness so there's a bit of a there's a bit of a link in the in the name and in the title to the to the narrator or the speaker's state of mind so yeah loads and loads and loads to go on there you know there's you're going to get more out of it than i've just given you if you sit and spend another half an hour reading it and go through it with a with a pen and a fine tooth comb and annotate it but in the meantime you've got you've got what i've just given you and if you've done this table you've got all your notes there um and that should be quite useful in terms of the structure of the poem the themes of the poem the power and control in the poem so yeah i hope that's been helpful if you liked it subscribe like uh whatever and good luck <laughs>